ladies and gentlemen, there isn't anything wrong with us. There's something wrong with the system. I believe that there are many, many well-intentioned, loyal, passionate renegades serving in the system, trying to make a difference, and I will not take away from their efforts. I firmly believe that the system which we are burdened with, if you make a difference, it's going to be for a very short time. We may perhaps be able to change a law or change an institution for a hundred years, but the institution will heal itself over. It will take what you have worked for and turn it into something else. I suggest that the clearest example of that is probably the most famous Ayasu in our history, a renegade teacher of righteousness, one who tried to tell the truth, who said, do not go into the churches, do not pray like the hypocrites of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, rather go into your closet and therein pray. And what he was saying is, do it yourself. Do not look for the saviors and the messiahs. Don't look for the answers out there. Because as long as we continue to empower the gods, as long as we can continue to empower the so-called divinities, there will always be a star being waiting and willing to tell us what to do if all we do is pledge our loyalty and our obedience to them. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been deceived. The most famous Ayasu, who railed against the system, who tried to set the rejects on a path that would allow free will and destiny. His works as a renegade have been perverted. His works have now become the very foundation of the institutions that he railed against. Tomorrow, if time permits, we'll get into the history of the early church. The first 300 years of the Christian church are replete, absolutely full, with political maneuverings and the deliberate twisting of the teachings of a teacher of righteousness to serve their own purposes. In fact, the writings, the Gospels, that which we now refer to as the Bible, was not fully written, fully agreed on, until 325 A.D., under the guidance of a king known as Constantine, who sought a religion for the empire of Rome, which would give him the status of a god, he sanctioned and took Christianity as the religion of the empire. King Constantine believed himself to be the Messiah. As most of you understand, the Hebrews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah, but they do accept him as a teacher. In the Quran, they deny the crucifixion, but they accept Jesus as a righteous teacher. In 325 AD, King Constantine attempted to make himself the Messiah. And having gathered... I believe it was 16 or 1,700 scholars with the stories and the books that were at the time considered to be the epitome of Christian thought. King Constantine gathered them together in a town called Nicaea. And in the Council of Nicaea, he asked for the stories that would make him the Messiah for them to be selected as the true book. Roughly 1,200 of the attendees protested. King constantly, immediately removed them. The remaining 300 or so scholars chose the stories that fit with Constantine's plan. In other words, the Bible was created deliberately by King Constantine to provide a religion to give him credibility so that he could declare himself as the Messiah. Tomorrow, with your permission and with your encouragement, I would like to talk about 
what occurred with Ra. When we left him, he was in power and was reprogramming the brains of human beings. He, in time, was undone, but the damage had already been put into place. The final thought I will leave you with is, and I've said that before in my apologies, is a very interesting thought. When Ra, realizing that he was about to be undone by the rebel queen and her minions, Ra decided to place the wealth of his empire in the hands of his children. The administration of the empire, rather than be given to the minions of the rebel queen, he handed over to trusted priests. Now this is approximately 6,000 years ago that we placed this transition, approximately 4,000 BC. The priests selected by Ra were known as Pareya. Pareya is an Egyptian word. You can look it up in the Hieroglyphs Dictionary. We have now interpreted this word as Pharaoh. Ra himself took the title Ka, which meant, which meant the ultimate father, the father of fathers, Ra Ka. His trusted priests were known as the Ra Ka Pareya. To the priests ran, were entrusted the administration of the empire. The offspring of Ra, known as the Ra Ka, suffix M, Ra Kam, these were the children who were to gather up the wealth and keep it safe. The Raka Pareya, the administrators, today would be known as the Raka Pharaohs. The Rakam, the holders of the wealth, today the word Kam would be known as shield as opposed to offspring. Over the thousands of years, it changed its meaning. The wealth of the empire of Ra was entrusted to the Ra's shields, the empire's administration to the rock of pharaohs. I am suggesting to you that 6,000 years ago, two families were put into power and they remain. I find it too much of a coincidence that the Ra's shields and the rock of pharaohs resemble the Ra's shields and the rock of pharaohs. 6,000 years ago, these families were put in power. Could they still be alive and well, conducting business and administering to the empire today? I leave that to you as a final thought. I'd like to, in the last few minutes, dedicate this to my daughter, Damien Storm, to my wife, Sue, to my family, Kat, Catherine, Karen, Richard, Mike, and all the rest of you who have assisted me. Ivy West, Rod Remlin, uh, Sherry, Debbie, Becca, all of you who have assisted us, thank you very, very much. To you listeners, my apologies if I have offended. I have only hoped to present research which will open the mind. I believe most faiths preach tolerance. I would ask you to tolerate but not accept what I have presented. I offer documentation on everything that I have presented. I offer other sources and other books. Some of you will reject it, and thank you very much for your time. Some of you will be interested, and I again invite you to give us a call. Please call Rod, call my family. We will be waiting for you tomorrow. Our phone number is area code 602-404-8050. Please let Mr. Rumlin know how you feel about the program. In the last few minutes, the Star Elder Papers, the story of the six young men who have rescued the star bean and how through them the inspiration for this work began. Terra Prophecy, which we will discuss tomorrow. The fulfillment of Hopi prophecies, Aboriginal prophecies, Egyptian stories, how crop circles and petroglyphs are telling us the very, very same thing. How the comet Hale-Bopp and Hyakutaki have absolutely fulfilled the prophecies. The quickening is upon us. The day of the second coming is about to occur. The last book is called The Second Coming Conspiracy. The circumstances under which we wrote it were extreme. It occurred less than two months ago. Ago, 
and on June the 6th of this month, after submitting that report to a source in Europe, I was hit by a hit-and-run driver. I believe it was a warning. I would like to think otherwise. This is perhaps the most controversial book that we have written. We suggest that a second coming is being planned. We suggest that the powers behind the secret societies and an extraterrestrial source are planning for the coming of a Messiah. But I also suggest to you that we best be aware because it is not the true divinity who is returning. Without betraying tomorrow night's program, I do suggest that the divinity, the star being, who is responsible for part of the experiment, is coming back. And the arrival time, 2011.